Well, our speaker this morning, speak this morning and after lunch as well, has a degree in geology and a PhD in earth sciences. He's a member of the Geological Society of America, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. His research interests include vertebrate paleontology, specifically involving uh, dinosaurs and pterosaurs. He's authored and co-authored several publications in peer-reviewed journals. He is currently an assistant professor of biology and geology at the Masters University just down south in Santa Clarita. He and his wife, Jessica, have three children, and he's just an all-around interesting guy. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Matthew McLean. Good morning. I want to go ahead and say thank you to um, Steve and also to, to Dr. Mortensen. Um, fantastic things we heard last night and this morning. I felt very encouraged uh, to hear from the Word of God and to be reminded about um, all of this ultimately being about God's glory. Um, it's interesting to ask questions as a scientist. It's interesting to think about things um, as a theologian, but ultimately we've got to be focusing on the glory of God. Um, that's why we do what we do. If that's not what we're focused on, then we are just kind of missing the point. So today I want to talk to you about whether the fossil record supports naturalistic evolution. And um, this is an interesting question, an important question. I was told a long time ago you shouldn't begin papers and presentations with questions because it could just be either yes or no, you know. Um, and you'll find out the answer to that. But both my talks this time ended up starting with questions, so I guess I'm disobeying that, but um, not intentionally. I just think it sounds better that way. Um, let me give you just a little bit about me first. Um, and uh, you've already heard about my wife and my three kids. I couldn't help but put them up there. That's an old picture because the youngest is now walking around and everything. She wouldn't be walking in that state. I mean, she's just laying there, you know. Um, but uh, no surprise, they like dinosaurs. But that's not just because I'm a paleontologist. It's also because kids like dinosaurs um, it's just, uh, and kids like animals. Um, my uh, second oldest there, Cody, I asked him if I could take his stigmolic toy to school because I was talking about pachycephalosaur dinosaurs, and he was like, okay. I said, I'll bring it back. He's like, okay. And uh, I came home that day. Where's the stigmolic? Oh, I left it at school. Um, and so he was very sad. And the next day, I left it again. But luckily, we had another person at the school that went to our church, and so they were able to bring it to church, and he was very pleased that he got it back. Um, and you know, our youngest, she can't talk, but anytime a dog barks, anytime she sees a dog, she wants to look at that. You know, and she's going, dick it, dick it, dick it, pointing at the dog. Um, I think that that is how God built us. God built us with a wonder as we look at his creation, um, a desire to see those things because they are his handiwork. And um, children can appreciate that. We should too. Uh, we should not lose that sense of wonder. And, I mean, that's why I became a paleontologist, because I'm interested in these things. Um, I always say, even if there weren't a creation evolution debate, I'd be a paleontologist, because you're looking and exposing the glory of God, and that's exciting. Um, so I work on vertebrate animals, um, and I had a thing up there. I don't know if we can see that again. Um, there, just so an example, um, this is a T-Rex bone at the top here, um, and that has T-Rex tooth marks on it, so that was fun. We got to talk about T-Rex cannibalism. Um, as part of our research. And uh, today, we are going to, getting to our topic now, does the fossil record support naturalistic evolution, or might there be another model that explains it better? Fortunately, you've already had Dr. Mortensen to tell you about what naturalism is, what naturalistic evolution is, but let me give you a quick definition so you remember. This is a view of the origins of the universe that states all things came about by natural processes over a long period of time, and all organisms can be traced back to a single common ancestor. This is the idea of the evolutionary tree of life. Now, all of this finds its foundation in a philosophical idea called naturalism. 
And as I said, Dr. Mortensen has already touched on this, so I don't have to go into great detail, but let me give you a definition. This is a philosophical belief that all things that exist can be observed by the senses and that only natural mechanisms are at play in the universe. If any of you ever saw the, saw the old show, um, Cosmos, with um, the guy's name I just forgot, so that's exciting. Sagan, there we go, Carl Sagan. Um, it happens in class all the time. The students just look at me, you know. Um, Carl Sagan, and he would always say that the universe, the cosmos, is all there ever was, all there ever is, all there ever will be. That's naturalism in a nutshell. Um, if you want a really simple definition of this, there is no supernatural. All that exists are the things we can observe with our senses. That is it. And so that is the foundation for naturalistic evolution. And I can, of course, give you a quick overview of naturalistic evolution. You're probably familiar with these things. There being a Big Bang almost 14 billion years ago, the Earth forming about 4.6 billion years ago, the Moon around the same time, and then life evolving. I've got up there 3.5 billion years. It's being pushed back to 3.7 or 3.8 but uh, life originally being very simple cellular organisms, um, which are going to evolve into all the different animals and plants we have today. I just have animals up here, but giving a tree of life, um, starting with more primitive animals like jellyfish and sponges, moving up into our, eventually our vertebrate animals, um, and man being at the end of that line. And support for this idea comes from the fossil record. When you look at the fossil record, what you see is at the base of the fossil record, you find um, invertebrate organisms, animals without backbones, animals that seem more simple to us. And as you make your way up, you find fish and then amphibians and eventually um, your uh, mammals and people at the very top. And that is what you see in the fossil record. And they say, see, that is support for this idea of a, an evolution of all life from simple to complex. Now, what I want to talk to you about is the process of naturalistic evolution. How does it work? Look at that line just in the middle there. All right. Time and diversity. Those are our axes. Here's what you have. You have an ancestral organism, and over time, that population gets split up, and they get a little bit more different. And then as more time passes, they get more different. Now that floating branch is joined in there. And as they get even more different over time, you eventually end up with a full tree of different organisms. Okay, so that's Darwinian um, evolution. That's what Darwin was thinking about when he wrote Origin of the Species. In fact, the only um, figure in his entire book is a tree that he drew, an evolutionary tree. And the idea here is that diversity precedes disparity. Now, I'm using some words you may be unfamiliar with there. Let me explain what I mean. Little changes over a very long period of time end up with big changes. That's the idea in naturalistic evolution. Let me give you an example. This is a fake example. This is not real, okay? Nobody believes this. Um, there are two leopards up there, the clouded leopard up on top and the snow leopard. Um, you can obviously tell the difference between these species, but they're obviously very similar animals, right? We both call them leopards, right? And um, they look like cats. They're just big cats. They're very similar. Well, the idea here would be that over time, the descendants of these leopards would get more and more and more different from each other to the point that you could get something like a zebra mussel at the end, right? Now, like I said, nobody believes that. No one thinks that zebra mussels evolve from cats. But I'm just giving you the example of this is a very, very different animal at the bottom than the animals that we saw up there at the top. They start out very different and they end up in very different places. So what we want to ask is, does the fossil record support this thinking? Does this actually come out of what we see in the fossils? Well, what we're going to do, we're going to make our way up the geologic column, up the fossil record, to see if the record matches the predictions we see from naturalistic evolution. And I'm going to hit five, or sorry, four points. Um, each time you see a star there, that's where we're going to stop. I could do a lot more. We don't have the time to do that. We may not even have the time for these four. We'll see what happens. Depends on how fast I can talk. Um, it's where you wish you were from Boston, right? But um, we're going to start down here at the bottom and see, does this prediction hold up? The first place we're going to look is the Cambrian. 
And we're going to look at something called the Cambrian Explosion. You may have heard of the Cambrian Explosion before. This is the abrupt appearance of almost every phylum of animal in the lower Cambrian. Okay, what are we talking about? Well, you remember in biology class at some point when you're in grade school or middle school or high school or something, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Do you remember that? Um, it's kind of fun watching these TV screens when I talk because I'll be like this, and then I see it like happen later. It's really cool. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, when you start really broad kingdom, right, all the animals are in one kingdom. Phylum is a little bit narrower than class, than family, order, um, oh, sorry, order, family, genus, species. See what a biologist I am. Um, and what I want to show you with this chart is something really, really interesting. Now, you look at this chart and you're like, that is nonsense. That's because it's in the journal Nature. And what you have to do in order to get a paper published in Nature is combine all your figures somehow into one figure. Um, and so that's what they did. It's just, you know, you look at that and it's like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Let me try and help you understand. Okay, along the bottom axis there, the horizontal... This laser pointer doesn't work up there. You see time or the rock layers, whatever you want to think about. So on the far left on the horizontal is the um, far distant past or really, really low rocks. And on the right is the present. As you go up this thing, the vertical scale is your number of taxa. That could be families, genus, species, order, whatever. In this case, we're looking at classes and phyla. So remember, it goes kingdom, phylum. Phylum is the next biggest division in um, the order of organisms. So um, an example of a phylum would be something like arthropoda, which is um, everything that has a jointed leg and an exoskeleton. So insects, arachnids, crustaceans, centipedes, millipedes, trilobites, all those animals, hundreds of thousands, millions of species are in the same phylum. Okay, so this is a really big group. Okay, now, where do phyla first appear in the fossil record? When you see blue up there, what you're seeing is the number of phyla at any given moment in time or moment in the rock record. What you might expect from an evolutionary opinion would be that your number of phyla would steadily increase through time, right? Because things are getting more and more and more and more different. Instead, what you find is right at the Cambrian, which is that green little box there, suddenly almost all the phyla appear. Just boom, they're there. And as you look through the rest of the rock record, you might only add three more phyla or something like that. That's really weird. That's not what anybody expected. And if you look at the yellow, the yellow is classes, the, or, the group just below that. So an example of a class would be reptiles or mammals or trilobites. Um, once again, almost all of our classes that exist ever show up in the Cambrian. There's more that get added in the fossil record than phyla, but still the large majority are there present in the Cambrian. And that is really, really unexpected. So what is below the Cambrian? Where did these things come from? Well, when you get below the Cambrian, you end up in the Ediacaran. And the Ediacaran, you get these weird things. Here's Dickinsonia. I kind of think of it like a pancake. Um, probably live like a pancake. I don't know. We don't really know what it did. Um, they kind of just flopped around, and um, people aren't really sure what these creatures are. Um, they're probably animals, at least most of them, but they're unlike anything we see in the rest of the fossil record. So we don't have any ancestors for these Cambrian animals. Well, what kind of things do we find in the Cambrian? We find incredibly complex organisms incredibly diverse, disparate organisms, things that don't look like each other, things with legs, things with eyes, things with lots of eyes. This is Opabinia. Opabinia has five eyes. I don't know why, but it has five eyes. And it also has a proboscis with a little grabber on the end, a claw machine. That's pretty cool. This animal's about that big. It's like 10 centimeters long. That's the fossil, by the way, in the lower right-hand corner. Okay, why are we talking about this? Well, let me explain to you what's going on here. In the Cambrian explosion, you get an abrupt appearance of hard parts, things with shells. In the Ediacara, nothing has a shell. Nothing in the Precambrian has a shell. Suddenly, shells are there. Nothing has eyes, let alone complex eyes in the Precambrian. Suddenly, in the Cambrian, you have all kinds of different types of eyes. 
Nothing in the Precambrian has incredibly complex body plans, but in the Cambrian, we have tons of different body plans that suddenly show up, and we have complex appendages. Here's one of my favorites. This is a nomalocaris. That's a fossil of it. It's what the animal would look like. By the way, this thing could get up to about a meter long. It's pretty impressive. Pretty terrifying creature. Um, but it had these weird grabber things on the front, and it had a mouth that looked like a big circle, and it had eye stalks, and it was an incredibly interesting, beautiful creature, and nothing like it is found in the layers below. So how does the naturalistic exp evolutionist explanation um, deal with this, right? Because what you expect to see at the bottom of the fossil record is a tree. But the Cambrian explosion is like if we just took off the whole bottom of the tree and suddenly all we had left were branches. That's what we see in the Cambrian. And then in the evolutionary model, we try and hypothesize about what those ancestors would be. But there aren't fossils for those things. There's nothing there. I mean, there's things there, but they're not the things you're looking for. So how do evolutionists deal with this lack of fossil ancestors? Well, some argue that the evolution of this event was so abrupt, no fossils are left behind. Other people say, well, the ancestors were soft-bodied, so they wouldn't have left fossils behind. Only things with hard parts leave fossils. Well, that statement has some issues because every fossil we have in the Precambrian is soft-bodied. And we have tons of them. They're finding new Precambrian fossils all the time. They all have soft bodies and none of them look like anything in the Cambrian. So that's not a good solution to that problem. Now, if the Cambrian explosion were just a one-off thing, right? If this were just like the weird fluke in the fossil record, Maybe you could give them some grace and say, okay, well, this is a weird spot, but everything else will fit. Well, let's see. Let's make our way up in the Paleozoic to the Carboniferous. In the Carboniferous, we have something called Romer's Gap. This is a 14 million year gap in the lower Carboniferous where there are almost no tetrapods, four-legged animal fossils at all. So you can see, and you're in the Devonian, you got a few tetrapods, and then there's this gap where you find almost nothing at all. And what's on top of the gap? Tons of different animals. Drastically different body plans of amphibians. Let me explain kind of the setup here. Okay? When you are in the Devonian, this is when tetrapods are thought to first evolve from fish. So you have animals like Tiktaalik here, which are the transitional form between fish and your four-legged animals. And when we get into our four-legged animals, you have things like Acanthostega here, or Ichthyostega. And here are their limbs. Does anything strike you as odd? Maybe not. Maybe you don't spend enough time looking at bones. Strikes me as very odd, because this guy's got eight fingers and eight toes on each foot, or hand want to call it a hand. And ichthyostega, we don't have the hands for it, but the feet have seven toes on them. That is really weird. Now, what are these evolving from, supposedly? There's the fin of uh, Tiktaalik. That's the transitional form for the arm, and you're not seeing any digits there. But I don't want to talk about that, even though it's interesting. What I want to talk about is, well, what are things like after the gap? Here's after the gap. There's Crassagyrinus. They like to call this thing the tadpole from hell. Two meters long. It's about six feet. It's pretty terrifying. Mouth. Chomp, chomp. Okay. You got Wachiria. Oh, no, sorry. It's Pederpes. He's a Wachiriid. Um, and you've got legless tetrapods. So something that looks like a snake, but it's actually an amphibian. It's called Naistopod. That's what's after the gap. Let me tell you something. These things look nothing like the things we just saw. They are drastically different, and notice how different they all are from each other. Vastly different body plans. Now, they have started to find fossils in Romer's Gap. Just the last few years in Scotland, they've been digging up, and they're finding little bits and pieces. But do you know what they're finding? They're not finding animals that are transitional from our Devonian animals into our Carboniferous animals. They're finding our Carboniferous animals, and they're finding our Devonian animals. That's what they're finding. The animals from below and the animals from above, they find them there. They're not finding the animals that link these. They're nowhere to be found. 
Well, let's go up the Paleozoic a little bit higher. Let's go to the Permian. Let's talk about our non-mammalian synapsids. What? These are your mammal-like reptiles. This is what we're going to spend the afternoon talking about, early afternoon. I'm excited about that. I've been very excited about talking about this. Why are they laughing? Okay. All right. So when you look at your non-mammalian synapsids, there are two basic groups. You have your pelicosaurs, like Dimetrodon, and your therapsids. These are the animals that you are supposedly evolving from. Okay, and that's what we'll, like I said, we'll talk about in the afternoon. I brought a friend with me from Masters. You say you bring a friend. You're talking about somebody you can talk to. Thought about doing ventriloquy for a while. I have so many of these skulls in my office, you know. Um, this is Dimetrodon. This is the skull of Dimetrodon. This is a big animal. This thing could get 12 to 15 feet long. Look at the teeth on that. That is clearly a predator. Um, there are lots of other animal bones from its deposits with Dimetrodon tooth marks on them, including possibly Dimetrodon bones with Dimetrodon tooth marks on them. It's a pretty crazy world. Um, and this is thought to be a very, very distant relative of yours um, on the line leading to mammals. Okay, I just wanted to show you that because how often do you get to pick up a Dimetrodon skull in a church? Okay, that's not the real skull, but it's a cast. I don't have a real, I wouldn't bring the real skull right here. And look at that, you know. Um, now, when you look at the fossil record of these things, what you see are two different branching things. There we go. Your pelicosaurs are on the left there. Your, ther your therapsids are on the right. Now, what happens if we remove the transitional hypothesized transitions between these groups, right? What if we just show the actual fossil records of these groups? That's what you see. Basically, two different faunas preserved at two different horizons in the rock record. A little bit of overlap, but most of them just kind of start without showing um, ancestry between them. We'll come back to that in the afternoon. Now, what if we jump all the way up to the Cenozoic? I wanted to go through the Mesozoic. We don't have time to go through Mesozoic. So much to talk about there. I want to go to right after the dinosaurs go extinct. We haven't even talked about dinosaurs. Just skip them. You know what? They get enough attention. There's some movie or something. Okay. Let's talk about mammals, right? When you get above where the dinosaurs stop showing up in the fossil record and what's called the paleogene. So your last dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, once you get to the paleogene, suddenly tons of mammal groups show up. And this has regularly been compared to the Cambrian explosion, an explosion of mammal groups. All, pretty much every order of mammals that exist today, you can find an example of it in the Paleocene or the Eocene. Just suddenly there. And if that weren't weird enough, guess what? Birds do the same thing. Once you get above that layer, suddenly there's tons of birds all over the place. And you know what I found out? Frogs do the same thing. And just recently I heard a talk that freshwater fish even do the same thing. Why is everybody exploding all the time? That's what we got to ask. I'm going to talk about spontaneous human combustion. Let me just go ahead and say it. These patterns are not what you would predict from naturalistic evolution. Now, that doesn't disprove naturalistic evolution. What I'm saying is, if I were an evolutionist and came to the fossil record, that is not the pattern I would expect to see. I would expect to see a nice branching tree everywhere I looked. Sure, they'd be missing fossils occasionally, right? You're talking about millions of years of evolution, but I would expect to still see a very nice tree. But I don't see it. So might there be other ways to interpret the fossil record? Well, one option is progressive creation. And listen, if we didn't have the scriptural account, that'd be a pretty good guess. I would look at things and I'd say, yeah, these animals were created and they were destroyed. And then these animals were created and they were destroyed. Because that's kind of what it looks like at first glance. But you know what? We do have the Bible. And the Bible informs our understanding on that. And so we can look at this from a young earth model. How might our understanding of Scripture inform what we see in the fossil record? Well, we think that certain rocks, by looking at the geology, were laid down by the flood— and many creationists, geologists, and paleontologists think other ones were deposited after the flood. And of course, some would have been deposited before the flood, as Dr. Mortensen talked about um, during the creation week even. 
But actual fossils, we think, are, you know, things that used to live. And so they're being killed later on. They're being killed during the flood and after the flood. And in the flood, what we would expect to see is preservation of different environments. And after the flood, we could actually watch environments change over time, which is pretty cool. That's what we'd want to see as a scientist. So let's revisit these explosions and try and understand them from a creationist perspective. Let's start way back down to the Cambrian, where you had fun things like Anomalocaris there, about to lunge on something. These Cambrian explosion deposits are all catastrophic burial events. And this is even in the evolutionary literature, they're saying this. I went to a talk at GSA um, last year, and there was an expert on the Cambrian explosion, and she was talking about how they've been doing modern experiments where they're taking worms and throwing them in these things and spinning them um, underwater, and they'll spin them for the equivalent of like 20 kilometers of travel. And then when they're done spinning it, the worms just go around, moving around, like nothing happened. I don't know about you, if I got tumbled around for 20, I mean, I would not be doing that, right? I'd be, I'd be long gone. But she was saying, we think these animals were transported from where they originally lived to where they were buried over hundreds of kilometers. I'm like, wow, that sounds a lot like what I think. That's exciting. And someone asked, well, the sand that you're saying that buried some of these things, the sand deposits, those things are hundreds of kilometers away. And she's like, yeah, I think that something happened there. So even in the evolutionary community, they're starting to think some of those ways. So what does this mean? Well, we think that the Cambrian explosion represents large pre-flood catastrophes or, and this is what I think, the initial organisms killed by the flood. Below this, you see something called the Great Unconformity, where there's a huge erosional surface that the flood would leave in its wake, and it would bury marine organisms first before the flood comes to land. And that's what you're getting. What about those Carboniferous amphibians, like Crassigyrinus? Well, in general, the Paleozoic before this is pretty much marine. You don't find any terrestrial animals. The first terrestrial vertebrates you get are in the Devonian. So could the bizarre appearances of these Devonian and Carboniferous fish and tetrapods be related to an environment which no longer exists? And this was an idea that Kurt Wise put forward called a floating forest, that there may have been um, forests of trees that could actually float on the water that extended out from the continents into the ocean or into freshwater bodies, and that God would have created animals that would have lived there that would have been very comfortable with water or land. And so we'd expect that their morphologies, the way they look, would match that kind of an ecosystem. What about if we go up to the Permian? I read a really interesting paper when I was an undergrad about um, why pelicosaurs evolved into therapsids, why this evolution was happening in these mammal ancestors. And the author said that he thought evolution in synapsids was being driven by changes in the environment. He thought the world was drying out. You had these swamps that were being fragmented into different forests. And I thought, well, I mean, obviously that's not going to work in the middle of the flood. But I thought that's really interesting. So what you're seeing is what used to be, a, you know, continuous community are getting preserved in the Carboniferous. And then you're seeing broken communities, fragmented pieces of things as you get higher in the Paleozoic. Well, maybe what we're seeing, these fragmented forests are actually chunks of the floating forest that have broken off, and they're getting buried a little bit higher than the main part of the floating forest. So our Permian communities then might be a combination of pre-flood ecosystems and short-lived flood communities. What do I mean by a short-lived flood community? Well, not everything's getting killed in the flood instantaneously. We know that because we have footprints of animals all through rocks that we call flood rocks. I think everything outside the ark that lived on land would have died. I mean, the text is very clear about that. But they could have lived for a while on. They could have swam around for a while. Different parts of the earth are underwater at different times during the flood. Land could reappear because it tectonics. These animals could climb around on there for a little bit before they perish. But what we see is something really interesting in some of these Permian deposits. Here's Dimetrodon trying to take down a shark, and the shark is trying to take down Dimetrodon at the same time. There are fossils of sharks and Demetrodon with tooth marks on vice versa. And you think about that and you're like, what are these things doing attacking sharks? And what are sharks doing attacking these land animals? Now, these are thought by evolution to be freshwater sharks. I'm not debating that necessarily. But 
that's really interesting. Why are these animals intermingling? Well, maybe they have to, right? Maybe they're running into each other because the world is so chaotic during the flood, and they have to take prey they wouldn't normally take. So what about our last example we gave, the paleogene, when you find all these mammals everywhere? Well, we think the Cretaceous paleogene boundary might represent the end of the flood. That's the current thinking. I think it's a good model. And so what you would expect after the flood is that animals have to recolonize the earth, and they're going to rapidly diversify within their created kinds. And so that's why we're seeing the sudden burst of appearance of all these mammal orders, all these bird orders, right after that boundary, because these animals are suddenly filling the earth, and they're going into environments where they can be preserved as fossils. But that leads us to an interesting question. Why aren't these animals lower in the rocks then? Why are we only finding them after the flood? You know, there aren't any human fossils that we found from flood deposits, even from immediately post-flood deposits. That's really interesting. So why is that? Well, let me give you a few possibilities. First of all, I suspect humans lived in communities with animals that are more similar to our animals today. I don't know about you, but as cool as I think this guy is, you know, he wouldn't be a next-door neighbor for me right? I would live pretty far away from this. Um, the pre-flood world, I think, was very different than the world we have today. Today, our world is dominated. When you go out to the African savanna, you see big mammals, right? I think the pre-flood world, if you had gone out to the equivalent of the African savanna, you would have seen big dinosaurs out there. You would have seen all kinds of interesting animals as opposed to our typical mammals we see. And so maybe humans, birds, mammals lived in these restricted locations that had bad preservation potential. Here's something else to think about. It's actually very difficult to become a fossil. Did you know that? I think it's very likely that there were tons of animals, people, plants that lived on, in the pre-flood world that didn't become fossils. Because to become a fossil, you have to be buried rapidly, right? You're not going to get scavenged, you're not going to decay, but you have to be brought into a depositional basin. So let's say you lived on the coast which all of our big cities today, for the most part, are on the coast, right? And if you have big floodwaters coming in, imagine a tsunami or something like that, and it picks you up and sweeps you back out to sea, you're not going to become a fossil. It's not going to happen. Because invertebrates and fish will eat you up. I know that's kind of disturbing, but that's what would happen. Um, or you'd end up in the ocean where there's all kinds of plate tectonics happening and uh, magma pouring out of the ground and things that are going to destroy you. The only way you get preserved as a fossil is actually if you get trapped on a continent in a basin where the floodwaters are washing you in where you can get turned into a fossil. So yeah, I wouldn't be shocked at all if humans basically didn't get preserved. They just got, boom, destroyed out there in the ocean. But let's talk for a minute about what you see after this boundary. What do you see as you continue to make your way up the fossil record? You know what you do get is a record of change. Actually, what we see is that the earth is recovering from the flood. And initially, the earth is very tropical and wet. You get giant snakes like Titanoboa and giant crocodiles down in South America. You get your horses that would have come off the ark probably were little tiny guys like this. They could carry around if you wanted to and put them in your purse. Um, you have a pretty big purse, but, you know, um, I'm a pretty strange person to do that. But you could do it. Um, and the teeth they had were for browsing, eating leaves. And then what we see as you make your way up the fossil record after the flood is the earth is drying out. And we see the appearance of large grasslands across North America, South America, Asia, Africa, Australia. And you know what? God built these animals to change within their created kind. They could be ready for this. And God built them to have the ability to be bigger, run faster, have taller teeth for eating grass. And you say, well, that kind of sounds like evolution. Well, the thing is, we know animals change. If you guys own a dog, I mean, none of the breeds of dogs you have Noah brought in the ark, right? He would have brought the ancestor for those. Animals change, but they change within boundaries. That's why we think very differently than evolutionists. And then you would have had an ice age on the earth after the flood, long after these things. And we suspect that maybe the ice age, maybe that timing is right around the time of, of Job, or maybe even wrapping up by the time of Abraham. 
Now, how do we understand these things? Well, what we can do is use something called barmanology. There's a big word for you. Okay, barmanology is something only creationists talk about or evolutionists who really hate us. And barmanology is the study of created kinds. That's why only creationists talk about it or evolutionists who really hate us. The prediction with barmanology is that there will be separate created kinds of animals and plants, just like God said in Scripture. They can change and diversify. God built them to survive, but only within their kind, not from one kind to another. So what we'd expect is not diversity preceding disparity. That's not what a creationist expects from the fossil record. We expect the opposite, disparity preceding diversity. Instead of an evolutionary tree of life, what the creationist expects to see in the rock record is an orchard of life. Lots of little trees, a dog tree, a cat tree, a horse tree. No, don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about a tree you can go and pick a horse from and take it home, right? I'm saying like these are, you know, you could call them if you want evolutionary trees. I wouldn't call them that, but you could call them um, diversification bushes, whatever you want to call them. But there are these small little trees, right? Just like you can draw a genealogy of your family. Humans all belong to one tree. Everybody from Adam and Eve onward. And the flood would have reduced the diversity, many of these groups, and they would have had to re-diversify after the flood. Just like people. There were all kinds of families of people that got erased at the flood. Only Noah's descendants lived on, right? And then re-diversified again. And the same thing happens with animals. So where does this leave us? The fossil record, although it agrees with naturalistic evolution in some ways— Sometimes it looks like it matches, right? You do get um, more simple animals at the bottom and more advanced animals on top. You do only get humans at the very top of the record. But ultimately, I don't think the fossil record supports the fundamental expectation of this worldview, what you would expect to see from the rocks. And I think that the fossil record might be better explained by young earth creation. It might be. But as of yet, do you know what? It's actually not. Now, I can tell you, I think, how the flood works. Maybe Paleozoic and Mesozoic, we think are flood deposits. Cenozoic, we think are post-flood. But notice I'm always saying we think. We're pretty sure. We lean this way. Do you know why? Because science is constantly changing. And that's a good thing. That's how science works. Scripture doesn't work that way, right? Scripture, the truths God gave to us remain unchanged for all time. For all time, even to eternity future, Scripture will not change. But science does. Now, why is our model at the moment not better at explaining everything in the fossil record than the evolutionary model? Let me tell you, we are lacking in manpower, right? There are probably less than a hundred young earth creationists, geologists, and paleontologists out there doing serious research. Almost certainly less than a hundred. Compare that to the tens of thousands of of evolutionary geologists and paleontologists. We are lacking time, right? Naturalistic evolution has had centuries to work on their ideas, but modern creation, geology, and paleontology, I mean, Dr. Mortensen talked about how there were these scriptural geologists back in the day, and then it just kind of dropped for a while, and nobody was really taking up that challenge. And we're also lacking in funding, Right? There's hundreds of millions of dollars available to fund evolutionary research, a lot less for creationists. Now, I want to stress, once again, this is a model. As I said, Scripture is absolute. It's the unchanging Word of God we can depend on to never fail. But science isn't like that. It keeps changing. It keeps morphing over time. And you know what? If some of these things I told you, it turns out, oh, actually, part of the Mesozoic is you know, post-flood or part of the Paleozoic is pre-flood or something. That's okay. That's not changing the Bible. It's just changing our scientific understanding of the way things work. And that's fine because that means our understanding is growing and changing. To be a good creationist scientist means that we hold fast to Scripture as our foundation, and then we explore the wild unknown, seeking to glorify God and enlighten ourselves with every discovery. And that's exciting. And we're going to talk more about that after lunch. Before we go to lunch, I just want to say one more thing. I totally agree with Dr. Mortensen about the state of Christian education, higher education. Um, Most even evangelical schools out there have totally compromised on Genesis. And it's very, very sad. 
Now, I'm happy to tell you Masters University is not one of those. There are some, like Masters University, that have said, no, we think that Scripture is correct here, and we're going to hold to that. And so I encourage you to go check out our booths. I've actually got the little armband right here for Masters University representing, you know. Um, go and check it out. After lunch, go and see what we're all about. I think you'll be very pleased to learn um, how we're trying to train people, train Christians for the future, depending on every part of the Word of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us to look at your creation, to think about the past, to recognize that even though we don't know everything, the essential things are the things you've given to us in your word. And your word is the foundation that we need for life and godliness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for creating the things around us that we can wonder at, we can be amazed at, that show your glory. Give us good conversation. Allow us to glorify you in everything we do. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.